Here to introduce tonight's speaker is Chris Hurst Leffler. Please join me tonight in welcoming Professor Timothy Kohler. Well, thank you very much, Chris. What Chris didn't tell you is that she also has or had an association with Crow Canyon Archaeological Center in Cortez, Colorado, uh, where she was an archaeological intern a few years ago. A few years ago. And I'd also like to thank once again the AIA, uh, the Orange County chapter of AIA for inviting me down. I've got two goals for you for tonight's lecture. And the first one is, I simply want to tell you a few things that I think we have been learning from the Village Ecodynamics Project over the last 10 years. The second thing is I want you to see, uh, by example, some of the new ways that archaeologists are beginning to approach the archaeological record and how, some, and how some computerized techniques in particular are beginning to help us understand and interpret what it is we're seeing in the archaeological record. So you'll be the judge as to whether or not uh, I make those work. Well, let's see here. Hmm. I'll do this the old-fashioned by hand way. There we go. So the area I'm going to be talking about tonight is this entire Pueblo area that's light tan here, coming down like this and going up like that. But I'm going to be starting out talking, first of all, about the Village Ecodynamics Project study area. Ecodynamics is, um, is, is sort of a made-up word. And all it means is that Ecosystems have some dynamics and they change through time. Human societies change the ecosystems by their actions and then they have to respond to the changes that they make to the ecosystem. So you can imagine that both of these systems, the human system and the ecology that they inhabit are both changing constantly and to some extent are co-evolving. So ecodynamics tries to study the changes in both of those systems at the same time. Uh, the big mystery for archaeologists working in the Southwest is shown by this sh shading here and this difference in shading over here because this entire area was occupied in, uh, say, from roughly speaking, A.D. 600 on up to about A.D. 1280. But then, very quickly, towards the end of the 1200s, it was uh, disoccupied, and the people who were still alive, because, and, and many people were not, ended up in these darker areas here. This is the Hopi area, this is the Zuni area, and this is the northern Rio Grande area. So that's always a big question that's lurking in the background whenever anybody speaks about Pueblo and archaeology. The other big question that lurks in the background is the mystery of Chaco Canyon, because Chaco really stands out as being very different from everything else in the Pueblo world. That is, you've got these large constructions that archaeologists call great houses and great kivas and roads. And it seems as though many of these things are echoed in other parts of the Pueblo world. And the mystery is to try and figure out what the nature of that connection was. Was it a, sort of a shared religion? Was it actually a polity where actions on the periphery were being dictated by decisions made by uh, chiefs or even some people would say kings in Chaco Canyon? Uh, it's, it's, a, it's an issue that we're beginning to try to approach with modeling, and I'll show you a little bit about that towards the end of this talk. But first, a really big picture, really basic stuff, and I'll offend anybody who has had any archaeology of the New World recently, but the first thing to know is that everything in the Southwest depends on maize on corn. By the time, um, uh, by the say 8600s, 8700s, something like 70 to 80 percent of everybody's diet was based on corn. So that's 
quite a dominant proportion. And by the end of the occupation, it was probably more like 80 or perhaps even just a little bit higher. Well, the thing that we know of as corn started off as this extremely unpromising grass called teosinte. And uh, soon, people helped to induce some relatively small genetic changes in teosinte that allowed it to start to become larger. And the larger it came, the more people depended on it, the more they planted it, and the more it spread. And we're going to see how it spread up into the Southwest. But the thing to remember about maize is that it's basically a tropical plant. So it likes warm and it likes water. So once you get up into the Southwest, it's a very marginal environment for that crop. And some years it does well in some places, other years it doesn't do well in very many places. So it's highly variable. Well, taking a sample of sites from all over North America and then charting the earliest maize in each of those and coloring them different colors, we see that this area right down here sort of southwest of Mexico City, the Balsas Depression, is the place that has the earliest dates for maize. Then you can follow the coloring up using this chart here, and you can essentially see that it spread up pretty fast into the southwest, getting up into this area around 2000 BC or just a hair earlier, and then eventually spreading out, but much later into eastern North America, where that became the uh, economic basis for the great Mississippian societies in the southeast, like Cahokia, for example. So uh, this, by the way, is a website that is constantly refreshed that you can look at. It's uh, 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 maintained by some friends of mine at UBC in British Columbia. It's a very nice resource. So in the southwest, some of the earliest dates are right there on straddling the border between Arizona and New Mexico, uh, just slightly older than 2000 BC, but roughly at the same time, down here in the area, sort of near modern Phoenix and Tucson, uh, there was uh, maize beginning to appear as well. And all this stuff is pretty small and not very productive. Eventually, it spreads up here into southwestern Colorado by roughly uh, 400, 500, 600 AD, quite a bit later. And sometime around 600 AD, there are also a couple new strands of maize that are either developed for the first time in the Southwest or that are introduced into the Southwest from further south in, in uh, Mesoamerica. And people are trying to figure that out right now. Uh, when this happens, this area really takes off and becomes... Uh, one of the two major heartlands of the uh, so-called Anasazi peoples that nowadays most archaeologists call pre-Hispanic Pueblo peoples. So about five or six years ago, uh, a French demographer named Jean-Pierre Bouquet Appel uh, came up with a great easy way that archaeologists could begin to understand uh, population sizes in places where they didn't necessarily have good, ar good uh, remains of uh, households and good s known deposition rates for materials and so forth. And he said, all you really need are some remains of human beings that you can date. And he showed that this worked very well in Europe and in the Near East. And he spotted, using this technique, something that he called the Neolithic demographic transition. And what that means is that as people began to successfully cultivate plants and animals, it made their population sizes surge so that uh, they would soon double, triple, quadruple the sizes of the populations that had been supported by a hunting and gathering way of life in those same areas. Well, we see exactly the same effect in the US Southwest. And uh, what we've done here is, is really simple. Uh, anybody could do it. You just have to 
do the mind-numbing job of going out and looking at hundreds and hundreds of archaeological reports, many of which are unpublished, and then tabulating how many uh, juveniles there are in each assemblage, what the date and location of that assemblage is, and how many adults there are. Then you sum those by, say, 100-year time intervals, and you look for changes through time in each area in the proportion of juveniles in each collection. Because what happens, Jean-Pierre Bouquet showed, is that if you've got a rapidly growing population, you'll have lots of juveniles in the population. And at random, some of, many of those juveniles will die so that a rapidly growing population will have lots of young people in the archaeological record. A, a population that's stable or actually shrinking will have relatively few juveniles. So this juvenility index, when it's high, indicates a rapidly growing population. When it's low, it indicates a population that's either stable or perhaps even shrinking. So the first maze that we have enough that we have enough human remains to be able to do this little trick uh, date to about uh, 1,000 BC. And, we, and these lines, these horizontal lines here in each case, uh, represent, roughly speaking, the zero population growth rate. And so we see that in the Sonoran Desert area, population rates uh, of increase are extremely slow. Uh, Whereas we can contrast that with the areas up over here where they seem to be quite high. And in fact, this northern San Juan is one of the village ecodynamics project areas. And this area here, the northern Rio Grande, is the other area. And both of these areas are rapidly growing in population uh, for, for most of their agricultural period. If we sum all these together, then we see this line here. This is now changed into crude birth rate, which uh, is the number, in, in this case, the number of offspring per person per year, the number of surviving offspring. It starts out, roughly speaking, uh, equal to what we have in the world today in terms of the crude birth rate. But it's soon, that is, by A.D., uh, 100, 200, something like that, uh, gets up to as high as the very highest country in the world today, today, which is Niger, and then begins to exceed that. So what we see is that, in fact, the crude birth rate is extremely high in the Southwest as a whole for this entire period from AD 1 to about AD 1400, something like that. So that's not exactly the whole story because it's just the crude birth rate. We also have to know something about how long people were surviving. So I've got a draft of life expectancy at 15 years, which is one measure of mortality. This is a measure of natality. This is a measure of mortality. We see that life expectancies are very slowly increasing up to about 8,700. Then they take a big swing upwards. Then they take a really fantastic dive downwards. Uh, and reaching this uh, awful state here uh, in the uh, late 10 hundreds, early 11 hundreds. And in fact, that probably reflects a major drought in the southwest in the mid 11 hundreds. That's probably what's driving that. Then they have a little bit of a rebound, and then they fall down again. The uh, uh, crude birth rate is also falling down. So what we see in general is high population growth rates in this area where we have high um, natality, but low mortality. And then we have low population growth here and also low population growth rates here. We didn't know this really about the Southwest until we started to put these numbers together. So um, that's one of the many different kinds of things that this crazy project I've been involved with, the Village Ecodynamics Project, has Most of the work, though, has been on trying to explain settlement change through time, that is, where people are living, how many people live in those places, why they live there, and how long they lived there, and of course, what their lives were like while they were living there. And of course, the big one, uh, why the Southwest is abandoned, it, the Northern Southwest is abandoned at that point. So our three study areas, we started off in 
uh, southwest Colorado in what we call the VEP1 area. Then we got to uh, this larger area here in southwestern Colorado. We keep expanding our horizons, and we've added a window down here in the northern Rio Grande. Those of you who know this area uh, know, will know Santa Fe is there, Española there, uh, Albuquerque would be down here someplace. So we keep getting bigger and bigger, and uh, uh, in fact, we're trying to begin to use some of the same techniques that we are developing in this project throughout North America, and uh, we'll see if uh, we're able to do that or not. How many of you have been to Mesa Verde National Park? Super, super. Uh, I started off my archaeological career in Dolores that's now uh, flooded, and uh, it's now underwater, but the Dolores River was dammed in the late uh, 1980s, no, late 1970s, uh, and there were excavations done there throughout the early 80s, and that was my introduction to southwestern archaeology. Uh, now, most of those sites are underwater. This is called McPhee Reservoir now, but uh, the, the sites that were drowned were hundreds and hundreds of sites that date mostly from AD 600 to AD 900. And of course, all of you know a lot about, or most of you know a lot about the archaeology of Mesa Verde with its famous cliff dwellings that date to the very last portions of the occupation in the late AD 1200s and then were abandoned suddenly and rather mysteriously. But what you might not know is that the earlier occupations were very much like these sites that we had down in Dolores. And uh, they start off with very small-scale sites with just one or two households living in pit structures. But then, over time, eventually, by about A.D. 1060 or 1100, we begin to see the appearance of much larger sites with as many as uh, 100 households in them. And some of these sites are... Uh, related in some way to the constructions that are going on down in Chaco Canyon at the same time. So one of the things we've done in this project, which is a lot of work but has been really useful, is to try to develop estimates of how many people lived in this entire area through time in each of 14 periods. This is a big area for archaeology to try and do estimates like that, and it's required collecting thousands of site forms and processing those in identical manner using some uh, uh, tools that allow us to partition the sites that are, have occupied for more than one period into how much of the occupation belongs to each of those 14 periods. And then we put little dots on these maps showing how big those sites were. This particular map shows the distribution of settlements from AD 800 to 840. Uh, this one shows the distribution of settlements just before the abandonment from 1260 to 1280. Notice you've got a lot of big red dots, and in general, generally speaking, uh, bigger dots on this map than you do on this map. And in fact, the population levels here are roughly three times the population levels there. And nevertheless, all those people were gone by, say, A.D. 1285. So if we were to sum all of these things and look at them, we would see uh, a population a curve that looks like this. Two peaks. This is in the Pueblo I period, A.D. 800 to 900. And this is in the Pueblo III period in the uh, early to mid-1200s. And then you have the rapid depopulation. Uh, and this rather odd little period in the middle in the 900s and early 1000s when you've got low populations. And that's been difficult for archaeologists to explain. Uh, but um, it probably has to do with a low frequency cold period in here that makes, that makes it difficult in this area to be able to grow maize successfully. So let's do the same thing down in the northern Rio Grande. And here we've got uh, the Pajarito Plateau, uh, which contains Bandelier National Monument. Have any of you been to Bandelier? I had the good fortune to do some excavations there in the early 1990s, and it's a really beautiful place. I 
highly recommend it. And then there's the, the Chama and the area around Santa Fe, and we recognize several different strata here as well. And just to give you a quick tour through time as to what happens with the archaeology of the northern Rio Grande in terms of dots on a map, uh, you start off, this is uh, the AD 900s, very few dots, and they're all small sites. Then you get a huge concentration of population arriving on the Pajarito Plateau in the 1200s. And then uh, here we have by... Uh, just before the Spanish arrived, the Spanish came into this area. Coronado came into this area from Mexico in 1540. And so this map is from roughly 1500 to 1540. You've got not very many sites anymore up on the Pajarito Plateau, but a lot of big sites right down along the Rio Grande, and then a lot of sites uh, up along the Chama in those areas up there. And the total sites size, the total distribution of people looks like this, peaks strongly around 1300 and then begins to decline rapidly. Now that decline is interesting. Part of it is probably some populations were drifting south of our study area down into what's called the Galisteo Basin south of Santa Fe. But also remember that this is the same time in which we have declining uh, crude birth rates and also uh, declining um, uh, 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 life expectancies. So it's also quite possible, and I think that this is the major explanation, that populations were just in fact declining for these sort of systemic reasons, not having to do with population moving out of our window so much as low birth rates and relatively high mortality. Now why is that, you might ask? Well. There's probably several reasons. <laughs> uh, and I'd have to say, I don't know all the reasons because we just came out with these figures on mortality and natality a few months ago, and we haven't really thought this through very well. It's a bit of a puzzle. But one of the things that happens is that as people move down into the northern Rio Grande, they start to live in settlements that are very much larger. And uh, as we probably all know, people in aggregated areas, say our big cities today, don't reproduce as well as people living in very small farming communities where they have many, many offspring. So that could be part of it. But it could also be that living in these very aggregated settlements uh, had deleterious effects on their health because of uh, diseases, uh, dysentery, things like that, that would have made for decreased life expectancy. And then finally, the third thing is that by some time in here, uh, there were beginning to be the first folks coming into the Southwest who were not making their living farming. They were the ancestors of the Navajo and the Apache, and then eventually later on, uh, uh, the Comanche. And they were very difficult for the Pueblos to deal with because they would raid the Pueblos. They would also trade, but they would raid and they would uh, make it more difficult for Pueblo and people to make a living. So as soon as they come into the picture, that probably also decreases, tends to decrease the population. So if we put both of these things together, what do we see? Well, let's call this a central Mesa Verde. This is the southwestern Colorado area. This is the northern Rio Grande down in New Mexico. The blues are this. Here's that nadir in the 900s, and then it picks up again very strongly, and then we have the decline at 1280, and bingo, that's exactly the same time that the northern Rio Grande population is ramping up. And there are many reasons to believe that a lot of the people who were here are simply moving down there. And they're probably at first responsible for that big burst of growth on the Pajarito Plateau in places like Bandelier. And then they move up along, down onto the Rio Grande and then up into the Chama. And then eventually uh, they are encountered by the Spanish sometime right around in here. And by the way, that also has a deleterious effect on the uh, native populations because of the spread of smallpox and eventually cholera and all sorts of terrible diseases that sweep through those populations in pandemic fashion. But these populations were, were 
it was possible for these populations to hurt themselves, too. And uh, here we've looked at the relationship between the population size through time, and we're just working now here with the central Mesa Verde up in southwestern Colorado. And as we move on this, in this direction on this scale, we're going, through, we're going to, to higher and higher population levels. As we move in this direction on this scale, we're getting increasing amounts of conflict. And the way we infer conflict is by looking at violent trauma on human bone. Most of this are people who have had their skulls bashed in or at least their skulls dented. But some of it is also perifractures on arms, uh, uh, damage from uh, arrows coming into the body cavity. Uh, and this is what the uh, projectile points look like in this period here. This is what they look like over here. So. The way to read this is to start off at AD 600 and then follow this through time like this. We're getting increasing population but not increasing violence. And as we move up this way, we're getting increasing violence. Then we come down here, we're getting decreasing violence. And then bingo, we come all the way up here and we've got an increase in population but a huge increase in violence. And what's happening then is that Chacoan populations are coming in from the south, from the uh, uh, San Juan Basin in New Mexico. They're bringing their great houses, their ceramic types, their way of life with them. But why so much violence at that point? Well, one possibility is that the people who were already there, who weren't very numerous, but were, but were still there, were attempted to resist the intrusion of the Chacoan populations as they spread up to the north. That didn't work out. Uh, they were unable to do that. And uh, there was a lull in violence, <coughs> even as population was increasing. And then, in the mid-1100s, uh, there was a huge outburst of violence, and that was just at the time when, in northern New Mexico, the Chacoan society was falling apart under that withering drought that I showed you in the uh, life expectancy graph, where the life expectancy went way down in the early 1100s and mid-1100s. That caused Chaco to fall apart. As Chaco fell apart, then, uh, something like 90% of the skeletons that we have recovered from that period show marks of violent trauma. That's a huge proportion. That declines very, very quickly in the early 1200s, and then as the area is being abandoned then, in the late 1200s, there's another uptick in violence that's somehow related to all these people trying to get out of southwest Colorado as their societies are falling apart. So if we were to just look at this record, we would say that definitely this polity falling apart is having a huge impact on the level of violence. But two other things are happening at the same time. First of all, uh, the climates are very poor. Maize production is very low. So that probably contributed. The other thing that you can't see on this graph is that there is also an enormous amount of variability from year to year in how much maize could be produced. I mean, the mean was low, but there was a lot of variability. So you had poor poor production, probably starvation. You had um, lots of uncertainty in how much you would be able to produce from year to year. And then what little overarching political structure you had was disappearing. And that was a recipe for disaster. And uh, fortunately, as uh, conditions were stabilized, in the late 1100s and early 1200s. And in fact, population grew under conditions of relative peace, and then things fell apart one more time. So looking just at that record, we'd say poor maize production in the context of high population, in the context of uncertain maize production, and polities falling apart give you a recipe for disaster. It's so slightly different if we go down and look at the record in the northern Rio Grande. Here we see high levels of violence early on, and uh, as population grows, 
the level of violence decreases. And here, there's not nearly as much variability in maize production because these people, for the most part, there's some dry farming, but for the most part, they're using surface water runoff that they control to help buffer variability in production. So we don't have so much variability. Uh, we do have a little bit of, uh, of violence in the early 1400s, but then it gets quite quiet again until the Spanish come in and, oops, we're over here, and then uh, that's, that's not too good. And then there's the Pueblo Revolt, and that's not too good either. But this does seem to show that what causes violence in these farming societies is really complicated, and it would be nice if we could just say, well, really bad maize production or really variable maize production causes violence, but it's not quite that simple because we don't see those patterns strongly in this record at all. One of the things, though, that differentiates this record from this record is that by about this time, by the early 1300s, this, the northern Rio Grande had developed societies that were different on a very large number of dimensions, and not just in terms of the, of the fact that they had lower violence, but this whole suite of things here. here. Here we have the central Mesa Verde. Here we have the northern Rio Grande. And you can just go down the list, and these contrast on all those dimensions. So here we have 8,600 to 1,280. Here we have 900 to the present, but we're really cutting it off when the Spanish come. But there are still Pueblo peoples living in the northern Rio Grande at places like Cochiti Pueblo, San Ildefonso Pueblo, Taos Pueblo, etc. Um, in the central Mesa Verde, rain-based farming. Here we have water-managed farming, less variable. Here we have a social organization that's based on lineages and clans. If you were to ask somebody who they were, they'd probably give you their lineage name and their clan name first, and then maybe their Pueblo name second. Uh, but here, the clans and the lineages become much less important. And if you were to ask somebody who they were, they would tell you, which moiety within a Pueblo they belong to. For example, the summer people, or the winter people, or the turquoise people, or the squash people. And then they might tell you what sodality they were in. These sodalities were things like curing societies, hunting societies, uh, things like that that specialized in certain kinds of ceremonial activities. And all able-bodied males got inducted into some sodality or another, and these sodalities had differential amounts of prestige. And then finally, they would have told you what Pueblo they were from. The clan ID or the lineage ID would not have been that important. And, it, and that might have actually contributed to declines in violence because as these uh, you know, clan-based societies tend to be at each other's throats a lot, and this... Uh, these, these sodalities cross-cut Pueblos, allowing people to have ways of dealing with people from other Pueblos and not necessarily considering them to be uh, competitors, but perhaps considering them to be allies and friends. Uh, so this is a, over here we have a high growth and high warfare society. Here we have, as we've seen, a lower growth and lower warfare society. We have low economic specialization over here, much more specialization here uh, in ceramics, in uh, uh, making obsidian tools, in weaving cotton, in growing cotton and weaving cotton. And all these things were being exchanged with each other, so you had those dependencies of exchange among Pueblos too, which is also serving to keep the amount of warfare down. You had the biggest things up in the central Mesa Verde were villages of maybe up to 500 people. In the northern Rio Grande, you had towns that were easily bigger than 1,000 people and probably some on the order of 2,000 people. Here you had small household kivas and some great kivas. Here the small household kivas, which are associated with lineages or clans, disappear and we just have great kivas. And here we may have more social stratification, especially at places like Chaco Canyon. And here we probably have less social stratification. So it's a real study in contrast. And the thing that is so interesting about it from the point of view of an anthropologist is that, remember, these folks who lived here mostly went here. So that means that these societies 
transformed themselves over the space of just a few decades from having all these characteristics to having all these characteristics. It's not as if all these people went there, nor were there no people here before that had their own traditions, but the number of people coming from here to here would probably have been at least as large as the number of people who are already living in the northern Rio Grande. And therefore, they would have had a very large effect on social processes in the northern Rio Grande. And yet, there were these fantastic changes over the course of, roughly speaking, one generation. So that's a really interesting problem to figure out. And one, we're, we're working on one aspect of this right now. We're trying to understand what it is that makes it so that societies in some areas develop uh, social stratification, develop political hierarchies, and uh, what might cause those to fall apart. And so um, here's a picture of the biggest uh, Pueblo, in, uh, at least in terms of its physical impos imposing size, Pueblo Benito in Chaco Canyon, uh, which dates from roughly the late 900s up to the early to mid 1100s. And it, um, remember it's not in either of our study areas, but that small versions of this, which are called great houses, occur up in the Central Mesa Verde study area, and those date almost exclusively from about A.D. 1060 to about A.D. 1140. A few of them are still used after 1140, but no more are built after 1140. So uh, in the first population cycle in the central Mesa Verde, we see some small-scale social stratification. We see some pit houses that are a little bit bigger than others, that they have fancier ceramics and things like that, that lead us to believe that there's maybe some real small-scale political evolution in that period. But things like elite burials, uh, public goods like roads, great kivas and reservoirs, all these things are either present only in the second cycle, or if they're present in the first cycle, they're fairly rare and not terribly impressive. So the high populations in the second cycle were connected with all these, uh, these, these fancy things, some of which imply a fair amount of social stratification and the development of an elite. So one of the things that we've been doing in the Village Ecodynamics Project that sets us apart from any other archaeological project that I know, and sometimes people make fun of me for this, is that we've spent a lot of time developing agent-based models to try and understand processes of change on this landscape. So an agent-based model is really a very simple sort of thing. It's, um, it's a set of, comp of computer code that... Um, makes it so that you can identify specific chunks of code with specific entities, and these entities make decisions. In our case, the entities are the households, and so we make virtual landscapes. We put households, virtual households, on these landscapes. We tell the households to do certain things. It might be as simple as just make a living on this landscape. And so, in fact, uh, that's one of the main things we do. Uh, we predict the likely locations of settlements under optimization assumptions. And those, w what optimization assumptions means here is that we say households go out and make sure you can raise enough corn, hunt enough game, Drink, drink enough water and cut enough wood to survive on this landscape. And moreover, try to find the place where you can do that at the least possible expense. And so they do it. You'll see some movies of that in just a second. Uh, that's fairly straightforward. It's not entirely as easy as it sounds because the places where the game are change depending on where you just hunted. Uh, the places that have the best potential corn production change depending on how much precipitation and what the temperature regime is like in that particular year. And we know stuff like that because we have tree ring records from this area that are sensitive 
on an annual basis to changes in precipitation and changes in temperature. So we can estimate the amount of maize production uh, in little squares, little cells on the landscape that are only 200 meters in size. And so the agents, the households, can see those changes, and then they can move to places that are more productive. But by the time they move there, maybe next year that place isn't going to be as productive anymore. So it's not an entirely straightforward problem. Um, so we do all these other things, too. And what I'm going to be talking about mostly is trying to provide local tests of general models for the evolution of leadership and warfare. Uh, but first, we have to understand a little bit about the base model, what I call the uh, ecological model. And it's very straightforward. As I said, you just tell the houses to survive on that landscape. And we have, lying behind this, models for maize production on the landscape, highly variable through time, just as you see there. And here's an example of the ecological model running, the little red dots are one or two households, yellow dots are three to eight households. Eventually, uh, there'll be 10 or more households on each of those cells. One of the things that happens is that they begin to uh, decimate the deer populations because as human populations rise, deer is the most attractive uh, prey species that they can hunt. And, and the green cells here represent the density of deer. And as the density declines, they turn black. And you can see that as households move into a specific area, they begin to decimate the deer populations. And eventually, deer pretty much disappears on this landscape from the archaeological record and in our models, but people instead began to use turkey. So uh, all was not lost. They still had some, uh, some uh, protein available, but it wasn't ideal because one of the things they were feeding turkey was corn. So that meant <laughs> that if corn did poorly, turkey did poorly, and people were deprived both of their calories and of their protein. So I want to turn now to this question of evolution of leadership. And just, I'm not going to go to it in great detail, but I just want to give you a flavor for what, it, what a model gives us in work like this, which is fairly abstract and fairly theoretical. But if you look at uh, this question of why leadership develops, which is a classic question in anthropology, and people have been worrying about this since the time of Hobbes when he wrote Levi Leviathan, for example, and uh, probably even earlier. I bet that some Greek folks, Herodotus, probably wrote about this too. So, you know, the two big theories have always been that uh, somebody is sort of strong and powerful enough to take over and force people to do what he wants them to do, or else that people realize it's in their best interest to band together under a leader to gain certain benefits from that, which could be protection from other warring groups, or it could be simply that people can achieve more if they cooperate together than they can achieve if they're each working individually. So. Um, for all those reasons, uh, we want to build models. And the specific model we've tried to build has been one that starts from uh, an ecological simulation, the one I just talked about. And then we add some group level dynamics. By group level, I mean things that uh, individuals do in groups that they only do in groups. And one of the things that happens in groups is that Individuals, if they co cooperate with each other, can achieve more. And we model this as what an economist would call a public goods game. And a public goods game works like this. If we all, this is a good idea, if we all passed the hat around here and gave it all to me, and let's say you each put a dollar in, and let's say there's 100 people here, and then somehow magically I would turn that $100 into $200 and then redistribute it to everybody. Everybody who donated would get $2 back for their $1 of donation. Well, that's a pretty high positive return for your cooperation. But you can imagine cases in which something like that could be the case. Imagine, for example, that we were in a battle with another group, and the only way we could survive would be if we all banded together and worked together. And so that, you know, in 
increases our return from cooperation immensely. And there are probably other similar things that don't have quite such a high return on cooperation, but nevertheless, you get more back than you put in. But here's the catch. There's always a temptation to defect. That is, that there's always somebody who, want, who will say as the hat goes past, oh, I think I'll just keep my dollar and I'll put in a little piece of paper instead. <laughs> and so the problem is if everybody does that, then there can't be, once it's distributed, any returns to scale anymore. There won't be any increasing returns anymore. So what do you do? You have to have somebody who's willing to watch if everybody puts in a dollar instead of a piece of paper and then punish the people who put in a piece of paper instead of a dollar. And that person in these models is called a leader. So a leader is a specialist in monitoring and in punishing people who don't cooperate. It, it's beginning to sound familiar, isn't it? So <laughs> we have structures like this in the modern world. Uh, so, um, so we have, we run these public good games, goods games within groups, and uh, leaders are more or less successful in, in making it so that everybody cooperates. And uh, then we also have another process in which when groups, as they grow, and we know the populations are growing in this time, they come into contact with other groups. And when that happens, two things can happen in our model. Uh, if you want to have some land that's within another group's sphere, these groups are territorial and they won't let you have it. But let's say one group is a lot bigger than another. The bigger group could threaten to uh, go to battle against the smaller group, and the smaller group will look around and say, well, you know, there's no way I can win. We'll just merge with you. And so the price of the merging is that they're going to have to pay some tribute to the group that's engulfing them. But on the other hand, they don't get wiped out which is probably what would have happened if they had gone to war. So it's a, uh, it's a mixed blessing, but it's possibly uh, better than nothing. Um, when, whenever a model like this happens in archaeology, you should always ask yourself, you know, why do they do this? Why do they even bother to do this? And I think there's always, always two answers to that question. And the first is, that you're always going to learn more about what's going on in this specific prehistoric sequence you happen to be working in. But I also maintain that eventually, if we do this enough, we're going to learn about these processes in general in societies, and so that we will learn what the general relationship is between, say, leadership, uh, wealth, uh, production, population by looking at models like this in many different societies. Okay, I'm going to move rapidly now, and I've explained a lot of this already. And so let's just look at a simulation in which we have groups growing. The groups start off as just households, and then if they're successful, some of them die right away. If they're successful, they grow. They uh, either merge with other groups if they come into contact with them, or they may battle other groups. If they battle other groups or merge, that creates a dependency relationship. That creates a flow of tribute. And in the simulations I'm going to show you right now, each of the little dots is actually going to be, it starts off as a household, but then it becomes a group. And you can't tell how many households are in there except by the size of the dot on the landscape. And so let's take a look at, uh, at these. Let's see here. Can we make this go? There we go. Okay, so when we get these little uh, lines running between groups, that indicates if it's a black line, it's a flow of tribute, and it's showing the direction of the tribute. If it's a white line, that means that there's a dependency relationship, but at that particular moment, that group wasn't actually producing uh, enough in its public goods game to send any tribute upstream. So now we've got, we're up to 800 here. We've got, it looks like, a one, two, maybe three big uh, groups that are probably battling each other out. The, the location of the dots here keeps moving because it's the average location of all the households in that group. 
And so uh, we're up to the 10 hundreds now. We've got, uh, sometimes we see little dots coming off. That's because as sites get too big for one leader anymore, they fission off. And, uh, and so uh, that's called, we call it a span of control variable. And uh, these are fascinating to watch, although they look slightly like monsters moving across the landscape. Uh, and now we're at 1299. So how many groups do you think are on that landscape right now? How many, and remember what I'm calling a group here is anything that's linked by a dependency relationship. Is it, there's actually obviously one there. So the big question is, is this all joined together so it's just one? Or is, are there two in there? Well, it's really hard to tell from this display. But let's look at it from another display. And here we're not going to use space anymore in the same way. We're going to just, this is exactly the same run, but the, the groups are going to stay in the same place. And now we'll just see the dependency relationship between the groups. And so this is a display that makes it possible to see those more clearly. So we've got this one group here, another group here. One, oops, that just joined there. So now we've got one, two, three, four right now. Uh, and then we had some fissioning. See, like, wow, fissioning all over the place. Um, but lots of times those groups will fish and then get taken back into the big site uh, that's right next to them. Now it looks like we've got two really clear big clusters of communities. So we could call these two big polities now. Uh, and then so we have some fissioning. Most of those uh, fission sites uh, don't last very long independently and they get taken back into another of these big groups. Now we're up to the 1100s. Um, we've up. Uh, yeah, we've got almost just two big groups now. Are they going to join? What's going to happen? Oh, if those two just joined. Oh, we didn't do it. So we've got these two big groups here, and then uh, a small polity here, and then some groups that are uh, independent. So that's what this model predicts. Now, given that... We're in L.A., and given that uh, we just had the Academy Awards, I would, I, what I'd like to suggest is that um, archaeological modeling is uh, a, a really good way to explore the virtues of ignorance, the unexpected virtues of ignorance. Because, <laughs> because when we write these models, we don't we cannot really predict with great accuracy exactly where they're going to go and what's going to happen because the space is complex. And as we run even very simple models through time, they produce patterns that we cannot exactly predict. Now, I don't really think that the patterns that we showed here are probably something that actually happened on our landscape. Here's the warfare uh, scenario that is generated by this. We do have a lot of warfare here. Uh, and not so much warfare here. And that's not too bad, but it doesn't fit super well. Um, but we will keep working at this, and we will figure out a model that fits that archaeological sequence a little bit better than we're doing right now. We've been working at this now for about 12 years, and we're starting to really understand what we're doing. <laughs> it takes a long time, uh, and we've learned some lessons, including those up there. Uh, but the, the biggest thing I think that I can say in support of using models in archaeology is that if we really want to ask major, deep, fundamental questions about human social systems, things like, do societies exist because they're adaptive? That is, they add value to the actions of each individual. Uh, uh, and things like, uh, how important are sort of the long-term slow processes that are structural in human societies, the sorts of things that economists would be interested in? How important are they relative to the sort of 
accidents of prehistory, the actions of important people, the contingencies, how important are those? The only way I think we can ever get at those questions is by playing off models like these with what actually happened in a bunch of archaeological sequences and looking to see how how it works. Is it the processes that are dominating or is it the contingencies that are dominating? You can't know that. There's no way that you can know that by looking just at the archaeological record or just at models of human societies. You have to be able to play both of those off against each other. Okay, so that's all I have to say. Thank you very much for your attention.